If you have your Bibles, turn with me to James chapter 5, and we're going to finish up, wrap up our series here on the book of James. Um, and, and so we're at the end of this walkthrough, going verse by verse through the book of James. And I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but as we've been going through the book of James, I think one of the strange things of this letter here is that we have very little direct reference to the life of Jesus. And, and by that I mean, like James, right, he is the half-brother of Jesus. And James became prominent in the Jerusalem church as a leader and pastor. And I think, you know, and, and it, doesn't it kind of seem odd that James wouldn't give us or add to his writings some of the stories of Jesus, especially some of those stories from Jesus' younger life that we don't have? I think we'd be really excited to know some of those stories of Jesus growing up, wouldn't we? You know, wouldn't that be great? You know, to have those stories is younger and um, we hear the stories of when we hear those stories from people who live next door to those who who have done great things and who are next door to the history happening we love to hear those stories I think James might have missed out on a fortune here telling us the stories of Jesus and what it was like growing up in the same household as Jesus. But if James is short on these incidents from Jesus' early life and all these other things, he's at least strong on the teachings that Jesus spoke, the words of Jesus. And in any number of places throughout the book of James, he repeats almost word for word things that we know that Jesus taught. And I think I think that these teachings that, that he gives here, and perhaps even some of the other things that he writes in this letter, is a very personal, intimate portrayal of what his older brother was like and what he was about. And so James writes about some of these things that are important to us. And one of the main things that we saw in this letter was way back in chapter 1, and it's that God uses pain to grow our faith. Now, whether God gives us pain or allows pain in our life, that, that's a different story. But God, when we have pain, God uses that for our growth and for our growth in our faith. And I think it's interesting. Everybody wants to walk with God, but no one wants to suffer. No one wants that, right? Humans do a lot of mental, emotional, physical, spiritual activities to try and avoid any kind of pain in our lives. And the problem is, is we want to follow God, but in the end, a lot of times we can end up walking away from God. And we walk away from God one step at a time when we don't meet God in the middle of our pain. When we're hurting, when we're going through a hard time, if we are not meeting God in the middle of that, it's so easy to walk away from Him. And James doesn't use the word pain here in this letter, but he uses the word trial. And so what is a trial? Well, a trial is anything that tests your faith. A trial is anything that makes you question in your life. A trial is anything that makes you doubt the goodness of God. A trial is anything that makes you say, God, where are you? What's going on? Are you even near me? See, trials give us pain. And James says we should deal with our pain or our trial by counting it all joy. He says, count those pains, those hardships as joy in your life. And we are to take joy not so much in the pain, not so much in the trial, or not even really in that, but we are to take joy in what that trial will produce in us when we meet God in the middle of it. And so there's a process that happens in your life during those trials and pain, during those hards, hardships. And so you need to know that a trial that is rightly responded to will result in a character that is fully developed. God will shape us in the midst of those if we rightly respond to them. And so God uses pain to bring us close to him. And we won't get close to God if there isn't any suffering in our life. Without it, we won't see him as, as well as we could with, if we, you know, never had it. And the Bible teaches us 
that our walk with God isn't just about loving God. It is that, but it's not just that. It's also about loving people. And so it's loving God, loving people. And what James does is he's closing this letter. He's wrapping up what he wants to write to the church. He's writing, he, so he gives this picture here of what it looks like to experience Jesus through one another. How we experience Jesus together. And so he sets up this whole section here in verse 12. And he says in verse 12, he says, but above all. Above all what? Right? This phrase here, but above all, has given students, Bible scholars, fits over the years. All right? Like, and it's given them fits because it begs the question here, where does this verse fit? Some of you might have it, you know, like those titles they give you for your different sections. You may see it in your Bible that this is above the bottom section of that title. Like, we, they just don't know where to put this sometimes. Where does it fit? But above all what things, right? And so what James is saying is, I think here, is that your integrity is above all of the things that he's written us so far about in this letter. All these other things he's written about are so good, and we need all of these things, but above those is our integrity. And this is what James is doing. He's getting his readers to focus on the main point of this teaching. He wants us to see that uh, this is the way that we love God for the long haul. It is through our integrity. We love, that's how we love God for the long haul, our lives. And so the way that you endure trials and temptations and pain, the way that you handle relationships with both people who are poor and people who are rich, the way that we handle our tongue, the way that we avoid the corrupt world, the way that we do biblical repentance, the way that we, we do biblical justice, the way, you know, all of these things that he's talked about so far is through relationships in the local church. This is how we do those things. And James is saying, most of all, I want you, church, to have integrity. And the word integrity comes from the word integer, which means a whole number. He's saying, I want you, I'm going to wrap this whole thing up here, all this teaching here, so that you know that you need to have integrity in the church, in our church, right? And so James is telling us that integrity is the foremost thing. It's the top, the pinnacle. See, your integrity will rule over you and how you view the Bible, how you read and then look at the Bible. A person without in any integrity in their lives will see the Bible as something that they can twist and something they can contort into something that will help them, make them feel better, live their life the way, any way they want, how it suits them. And so your integrity rules over whether or not you show preference to people. A person without any integrity will show favoritism. They'll form cliques and they'll hold themselves in judgment over everybody. Your integrity rules how you do good things, like good works, right? A person without integrity will do good works for personal gain and recognition and what they can get out of it. Your integrity rules over how you use your tongue. A person without any integrity will use their tongue to try to control and manipulate and even consume and condemn people around them. Your integrity will rule over how you use wisdom. See, a person with no integrity seeks and possesses wisdom that is earthly, sensual, and of the devil. And wisdom that only results in strife and confusion and evil works. It's things that sound good, but it's not. Your integrity rules over your pride. A person without integrity is selfish. They presume to know everything. They're greedy. And then another thing here, your integrity rules over how you practice patience. See, a person with no integrity cannot patiently endure whatever's happening in their lives because they have no rock to anchor to. So the question we need to ask this morning is, is how are we to be the church? What does it look like to be the church? And the first thing that James tells us here in this section is, is we have to have integrity with our words. Okay? Look at verse 12. 
you have your Bibles open, James chapter 5, verse 12 tells us, But above all, my brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. So James here, if you think, think well, that verse kind of sounds familiar, well, James is quoting here from the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' words. Right? We just finished the Sermon on the Mount before we did James, so hopefully that's kind of familiar, right? But he's quoting word for word from Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. And so what is this kind of swearing that Jesus and James are talking about here and forbidding us to do? Well, for us to figure that out here this morning, we have to take a look at the Jewish customs of their day. And by the time that the, the New Testament was being written, the Jews had developed an extremely complex system of swearing oaths. And in many ways, it was similar to our legal system today. It was extremely complex, and there was almost always a loophole with everything that you did. And so because of the complexity of the system, that there, there were people who would find ways to get out of anything that they swore an oath to. So they would swear an oath to do something, like they were signing a contract kind of like thing, and they were doing that full with full intention of wriggling themselves out of that contract, out of that oath. And it was done really the same way that some shady businesses use contracts today, right? Like the contract has all of the good stuff and the big, bold point print, and you can read that real easily, but then it has all of the loopholes, right, and all of the legal jargon in that really tiny small print that you need a magnifying glass to even read, barely read. It's kind of how this worked. And so developing these deceitful contracts like that would be like the kind of swearing that Jesus and James are talking about here. Any kind of swearing where you acknowledge the possibility of eventually trying to get out of that situation, not fulfilling your end of it. And James is not saying you can't swear an oath. So this doesn't mean that you, you have to get all upset if you go into court and you know, say you swear to tell the truth. Whether you put your hand on the Bible now or whatever, depending on where you are, if you still do that, right? He's not talking about worrying about that because Jesus took an oath. Abraham took an oath. As many as a lot of other people took oaths in the Bible. And so this isn't a legal restriction here on us. So what he's saying is, is there cannot be any levels to truth. Okay? There can't be any levels to truth. Your yes in a courtroom should be equally powerful as your yes to another person. And so you tell the truth no matter where you at, where you are. And so James has already told us back in chapter 3 that our tongues are a reflection of what is happening inside of our hearts. And so our words, which include the ones that we speak to ourselves, all of our words, even those to ourselves, are laid before God. Are they really before Him? And so we have to have integrity with our words. Don't tell somebody, you know what, hey, I'm praying for you, and then never pray for them. That's what this is about. Don't tell someone, you know, hey, it would be so good if we could get to lunch sometime and get, get together and do that, and then never follow through. When we say things like that, we don't represent the truth. And what happens is, is community is broken. Have integrity with your words. This is what it means to be the church, to have integrity with our words. And then he goes on to say, we are to have integrity with our emotions. Look at verse 13. He says, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing songs of praise. What James is saying here is that you need to be honest with what state you are in. You need to identif you know, identify really what's going on in your inner world, what's happening inside of you. And so this is actually more difficult than it really sounds. This presumes here for us that we're actually in touch with our emotions. And we can get so caught up in doing a whole bunch of things and, and, and having all this noise and, and working and doing all that that we are not very good at hearing what's happening inside of us. And we ignore all of that. 
We ignore our emotions, and it's not healthy for us to do that. James is asking us here, do we know when we're really suffering? Do we know it? Versus when we're happy. Do we know the difference? Suffering versus happy. And if you're suffering, don't, he said, he said, don't just increase your meds and complain to your friends, but he says you also need to go and pray. Pray to God about it. Pour out your heart to God in the midst of your suffering, your hurts. Are you happy, he says? Then you should, you know, don't think that you just deserve that, that you've done all of that for yourself. And don't just thank other people. He says, praise God also for all of that, for what you, he's done in your life. Yeah. And so this is assuming, again, that we're in touch with our emotions and that we then take our emotions to God. Whatever it is that's going on, we take that to him. And some of you may say, well, that sounds really good, but I have a, fr a really good close friend who listens to me, or, uh, you know, I can, I can really go to my parents and I can talk to them. We just have this good relationship, or, or I do this with my spouse. We have an open, really good communication. Let me say that's good, that you have those things in your life. Friends are good, but let me tell you, they're not God. They're not God. And James is saying, have integrity with your emotions and take your emotions to God. Connect with God in the midst of your trial, your hurt, your hardship. Connect with God in the midst of your successes. Connect with God in your sadness. Now, don't just go to God, though, right? Because Christianity isn't just loving God, but it's also loving people, too. And so you need to also go to the church. And so we're, there, we got to see there's a, this is all together here. And the next thing he tells us is, is we need to have integrity with our pain. Look at verse 14, James chapter 5. He says, Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And so James here now is pushing on our self-sufficiency. He's saying, In your weakest moment, don't just call on God, but also call on the church. Get the church together. It's good to go to God in those moments when you're sick, but there's also a need for us to go to the church for prayer. Get together and let people pray for you. He says, call on the elders or the leaders of the church to pray. And so he's pushing here our view of the church. What most people do is when they hurt or they come into church is they try to hide their weaknesses. They don't want anybody to see that. They want to see every, they want to show everything that's good. They try to hide all of the weaknesses. And we don't really ever share our sicknesses with the church, our, our, our hardships. And that's what James is saying here. This is what he's trying to get us to, to understand is, he's saying, be sick in front of people. Let people know that you aren't okay when you're not okay. Are we willing to let people help us out in our pain? Are we willing to do that? Because there's many people who go to church, but there aren't a lot of people who open themselves up to the church. And James is saying, make sure you invite people into your life. Make sure you have integrity about the pain that you have in your life. And in our pain... We need God, and we need each other. We need each other here in the church. We need God, both of these things. And to have integrity, we need to let people into our lives and stop trying to do all of this by ourselves. We can't solve all of our problems. It just doesn't work that way. We need help from time to time. And when we try to solve all of our problems by ourselves, what we end up doing is we end up trying to be our own God. We're not looking to God. We're not doing anything else. We're trying to do it ourselves, and we're making ourselves God. And then James goes from that, and he talks about healing. Look at verse 15. And he says, And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Now, there's a lot of opinions about this verse here, and the key phrase of this verse is, A prayer offered in faith. What's a prayer of faith? What's a prayer of faith? Well, a prayer of faith is that we expect God to do things that are impossible for people to do, right? Like, 
I'm sick. What, this is what he's talking about here is sickness in this moment. So I'm so sick and I, I don't know how to get healed from all this. What's going to take for that? And so I'm going to trust God to do that because I can't do it. Nobody else can. And so it's, it's, this, it's this area where if God doesn't do it, it's not going to happen. It's a faith expectation. Also a prayer of faith is a prayer of reliance and submission, right? This is where we're trusting God to be God in our lives. This is where we're relying on the timing of God in our lives, knowing that God's delays are not always his denials, but God does say no to some things that we think he should do in our lives. Sometimes he does. And so it's both a prayer of expectation and it's a prayer of submission. It's a prayer, God, we expect you to do this, but if you don't, we're okay with that. So it's not just a prayer of faith, but it's, you know, it's not just a prayer of faith that God, will, you will heal, but it's a prayer, God, if you don't heal, I will still trust you. You are still God, and you are good, and you're sovereign, which means you have everything under control. You know what's best for me. And so it says in the Bible that a prayer of faith will heal the sick. So what happens then when someone is sick and they don't get healed? What happens? Is the Bible wrong, or did that person not have enough faith? Well, James is saying that whether it's by medicine or it's by prayer, we are to trust God's sovereignty in our lives, that he has everything under control. And so prayer is never a command, it's always a request. Prayer is asking God by any means necessary, please do what I'm asking you to do. And so you may be saying, you just said something about medicine. Where does the medicine thing come into all of this? Well, it's the idea here of the anointing with oil he talks about here. Many scholars believe that this has to do with medicine, the anointing of oil. Now, there are churches that when people, when they pray over people, they anoint them with oil, and, and we do that from time to time here at this church as well. And, and we see that Jesus, that when they prayed, they anointed people with oil. When Jesus shared the story of the Good Samaritan, the Good Samaritan picked a guy up who was beaten on the side of the road, and it says that he washed out his wounds with oil. And so in the first century, their oil was their medicine. And so I think he's saying prayer goes along with medicine. Paul, with God's power, he saw people raised from the dead back to life. He saw many supernatural healings. But when he was writing to Timothy, who was his protege, protege, who he loved completely, he said, you've got some stomach issues, so drink some wine. Now, why would he say that? Why would he say that? It's because sometimes God heals naturally and some, with medicine, and sometimes God heals supernaturally through prayer. It's the way he works. And so it's oil and prayer, James is saying here in our passage. And it's an acknowledgement that God works naturally and sometimes he works supernaturally. And so when we're saying God, to God in prayer, you know, this, we're, we're, doing, we're going to God with this prayer of faith for healing. It's God, whether it's by medicine or whether it's your supernatural power, divine strength, heal. Heal me. That's what he's saying here. And we don't care how it's done, we just want to be healed is really what this is about. And so he's saying, use the doctors, use the medicine, use whatever you want, but please heal me, God. <laughs> and there's this element of faith with, faith with all of this. You need to believe that God can heal you, that God loves you and he, he can do that. He can bring the healing. But I don't think we put it all here on faith. I think there's a sovereign mystery to all of this here. And so we pray intensely. We also can use medicine, but he says the other thing we need to do is we need to look at sin. And this is a hard one for us here. Sin can cause physical illness. Not all sickness is the result of sin, okay? But it can. Sin can cause sickness. And James is telling us that a sick Christian should look first at the sin that's in their life. Look at the spiritual causes, maybe even before you look at the physical causes of your sickness. And this is not to say that we don't go to the doctor, but along with that, we ask God, is there anything in my life that is causing this illness? 
And we see this in the Bible. Sometimes sin causes physical illness. Not always, but it does sometimes. And sometimes when we repent of our sin, God heals us. And when we're really sick, what we tend to do a lot of times is we get really introspective in our lives and we're like looking to see what's happening in our lives. Well, sickness sometimes can be that spark from God to get us to where we need to be, to look at our own lives. God, is there something that I need to do to change? And we can get all self-sufficient, and it can show us how much we think we don't need God. And sometimes God blesses us with sickness so that we look at ourselves and look at our lives and see, yes, we definitely need God in our lives. Physical illness can sometimes result in a spiritual renewal in our lives. And James is saying, when you get sick, repent before God. When you get sick, call the people of the church to pray for you. And your temptation when you get sick is and when you're hurting is to isolate yourself. And James is saying that is not what integrity is. Don't do that. Sickness should lead you to connect with God and with people. And then he tells us though here, maybe, there it is. Oh, we went flying by. Can you go back for me? We're having fun with that one. We need to have integrity with our community. Okay, look at verse 16. It says, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it, it is working. And then he gives us an example with that verse there, and it's in verse 17. He says, Elijah was a man with, na with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. And then he prayed again and heaven gave rain and the earth bore its fruit. I'm not even going to try. Go to the next one. And it says, so two things that James tells us here about church community. First is, is we are to confess our sins. James is saying, let people into your life. And you can say, yes, but some people can be untrustworthy. I don't know if I can put my trust in them. They're broken sometimes. They're harsh. And yes, that's true, but guess what? So are you. And so was Elijah. The Bible talks about Elijah in these great terms, and he, was, he did some great things, but in this moment here that this verse is talking about was the worst part of Elijah's life. He was weak, he was discouraged, and this was one of the most humbling experiences and moments of his life, and God answered his prayer. And what James is trying to show us here is that you have a bunch of Elijahs in your life. Sometimes they're good, and sometimes they mess up but God has put them around you he's saying you need to trust weak and sometimes people who make mistakes in the church who have been made righteous by God which means that their identity isn't in who they are but it's in what God has done for them and what Jesus did and they're trusting in Jesus and faith and that means that their righteousness isn't based upon their good things and their goodness it's declared upon them because of the goodness and the grace of God in their lives and these are the people that we should be agreeing with about God agreeing with with God about our sin is there anyone in your life who knows the dirt about you should be. He says, confess your sins to one another. Be careful with that, but there should be, people, should be some people that you can trust and say, I'm struggling with this. Can you help me? And then we go one more page here, and he tells us here that the other thing is, is we've got to confront other people's sin in love. Look at verse 19. He says, my brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wanderings will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. And the beautiful thing about the church is, is we are all sinners, right? All of us. And the beautiful thing about the church is when we stray as sinners, we have people who are fellow strugglers who can come and help us back, bring us back. And there are times when we need to just help each other out when they're struggling with sin. 
but it has to be done in a loving way where you have to see the person, you, you want to see them made right with God. You love them and care for them. You're not judging them and saying, I'm better than you. Look, you're, so you're such a horrible person. I'm, I'm so good. No, that's not what this is about. It's saying, I understand I struggle too, but I see this is, you know, you're, you're heading for destruction. How can I help you get to where God wants you to be in your life? And you bring somebody back. This is what God has called us to be as a church. And when you experience something like that, let me tell you, you'll never be the same when it's done in love. I don't always want it. Let me be, let me be honest with you right now. I don't always want that in my life. But this is the blessing of being a part of the church. And if you're not actively confessing your sins to other people, if you're not, you know, helping and encouraging people and in, in to, to run for after God and seeing God in their lives, then we're really not being the church. Really not. You may be going to church, but you're not being the church. You're shortchanging yourself and your relationship with God when you're not really in with integrity. He's shortchanging others as well. And so James ends this letter by talking about our walk with God, what it really means, and he begs us and he invites us to be the church, to really be the church. And for some of you here today, maybe you're watching today as well, and you're sick in your body, we want to pray for you today. We want to pray that God will bring you healing. Some of you need to talk to somebody today and just confess your sins. You say you're struggling with it and you just don't see any way out of this thing. You know you need to stop it and you, you're just, it's not, talk to somebody you trust today and help to confess that and see if they can help you with that, with the power of God in your life. Some of you need today to commit to being the church and not just going to church. So we're all in and we're a community who love each other and encourage each other and worshiping God. We're loving God and loving each other. And whatever response that you need to make today before God, I want to encourage you to, to just to take that and make that commitment before him today. Let's really be the church because that's what our church needs and that's what our community needs is for us to really be the church. Would you bow your heads as we close this morning? James really ends this with a challenging, challenging message for us. To live with integrity in front of each other here, before God and before each other. To love God and to love each other. And as we talked about these different things of integrity this morning, maybe one of those things hits you really hard, and, that's, and you say, that's not me. And I see today, this is what God is calling me to, to do in my life, to, to be and to have this integrity in this section here. I'm doing pretty well maybe in some of these other ones, but God is saying, this one right here. And if that's you this morning, would you make a commitment this morning with God to say, God, I'm going to live by your power with integrity in this way. God, with your power, help me to really love you because you love me and recognize the love that you've given me and everything. But even more than that, Lord, help me to love those around me to love those that I worship with, to encourage those I worship with, that we can truly be a community, God, that you've called us to be of the church. And so as we sing this song here, would you take that before God this morning? Wherever he's leading you, would you just say, God, I'm going to commit this to you this morning. I'm going to trust you that your ways are right. Take it before God and then join us in singing here this morning, and I'll wrap up in just a moment.